Hi and welcome to another episode of Lighthouse. Lighthouse is our way of bringing God's light into your house. Today I'm so excited about this topic because it's a topic that we've all longed for and uh, waited for to have and to have someone really um, knowledgeable to talk about. So today we welcome uh, Father Sam Fanous. He's actually a history lecturer at the Theological College here in Sydney, and he will take us through the history of the Orthodox Church today. There are so many questions that, um, that this topic brings about. For example, like, do we still live in the first century church or have things changed? Um, what is the timeline of these changes that have happened in our churches? Are we still united or can we be still united again as one body and one church? So to answer all these wonderful questions, let us all welcome our beloved Father Sam Fanous. Welcome to Lighthouse, Abuna. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so tell us, Abuna, like, are we still living in the original Orthodox Church? Um, well, the phrase that you use there is a little bit inaccurate, the original Orthodox Church. Yep. In fact, the original church, St. Paul didn't, and St. Peter didn't consider themselves Orthodox. That's they right. They considered themselves Christians. It says Christians were first, uh, they were first called Christians in Antioch. Um, Orthodox, Catholic and Protestants are things that came much, much, much later. But the original church was the Church of the Apostles, uh, where they broke bread together, they ate together. Um, you know that in the book of Acts, they came and they gave all of their money to the church. Um, mm. So that was kind of the original church. To say, are we still living the same way and worshipping the same way the first century Christians did? I would say, in essence, yes. In expression, no. Mm. Um, the way they celebrated the Eucharist um, is different than the way we celebrated the Eucharist. In fact, the very earliest church would often celebrate with a meal. And at the end of the meal, it was an agape meal, which everyone would bring together some food. Um, and then at the end of the meal, the uh, presiding priest would pray over the bread and he'd give thanks. That's why I've called the Eucharist, Thanksgiving. Um, he would give thanks over the bread and the wine and distribute it much in the same way Christ did uh, in the Last Supper. Over time, that changed um, till it became a meal on its own. The meal was separate and then it became the Eucharist on its own. And that development happened over a number of, of years. Mm. So certainly we don't express it the same way now, but the essence of what they were doing was exactly the same as what we're doing. St. Ignatius, who was in the, the first century or the beginning of the second century, on his way to martyrdom, he wrote a letter and he called the Eucharist the medicine of immortality. Wow. So in essence, we are still doing the same thing the early, earliest Christians did in the sense that we offer up the Eucharist as a thanksgiving to God and we believe and we partake of it as his flesh and his blood, which he has offered for the life of the world. And in every respect, if you trace the Orthodox Church, or traditional churches, mm. back to the early church, you'll find that the essence of what we're doing is exactly the same as the earliest Christians. The way we baptize, or may vary, the way they baptized in the earliest church, especially in the first century, was very different. Oh, really? The Didache that. says that one of the earliest uh, extra uh, scriptural books, books. the Didache, um, says you baptize in cold water. If you don't have cold water, warm water, running water, so, you know, you can baptize wherever, mm. so, so long as you've got water. Um, and, but what baptism actually meant, that we die with Christ and we rise with Christ, as St. Paul says, that is still what we hold dear to this day. And certainly a lot of our practices, for example, the renunciation of Satan that we do in baptism, um, all of those can be traced back to a very early, early period. Mm. So what I would say is in expression, the church is always changing. We don't even pray the same way we prayed a thousand years ago. Um, or, you know, in terms of language, in terms of hymns, in terms of tunes, in terms of dress, but in terms of essence of orthodoxy and essence of the Christian faith, 100% we are in continuity with the apostles and with Christ himself. Mm. No, that's beautiful. So what would you say for people that were uh, like asking like, how come we can't, like, as Coptic Orthodox, for example, can't go to a Greek Orthodox church? And, you know, oh. and they <laughs> take you, like, they're like one that we, we use the same terminology, Orthodox, but how come they're still different to us? In, in what sense are they different? They do pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. what, what's the issue there? You know, we know that the Catholics may be a bit different and they're Protestants as well. But when you go to, like, Orthodoxy and try to match them mm -hmm. up, where we, where's, where's the mishap between the both, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It's a long story, yeah, but I'll yeah. try and sum it up yeah, in, in as quick as possible. Yeah, please. <laughs> um, 
actually in the beginning were all Christians. Mm. And there were big Christian centers. You had Alexandria, which is the Seal of Alexandria, the Seal of Alexandria which was one of the earliest, which was the earliest, um, pretty much major sea. You had Antioch, you have Jerusalem, you had Rome. These are the earliest seas, um, all t- separate geographically mm. and even in expression, the way they worship, separate, but united by the same faith. Um, they were just locations mm. where major political areas where Christianity, you know, spread. Over time, um, as heresies developed and as practice developed, the Christian church had to come together to deal with these issues. And that's why you have the councils, which I'm sure we'll come to later. Yeah. They came together to deal with some of these issues. And what generally developed over centuries was the Church of the East, which was kind of based around Constantinople mm-hmm. um, and Alexandria, and then the Church of the West. And when I say East and West, I mean the Roman Empire. So the Church of the West, based around Rome, developed its own style, mm. basically speaking Latin. You know that the Catholics up until very recently were speaking Latin in their, in their worship. And the East developed a particular style. Because Rome, the Roman Empire, basically dissolved between East and West, and the West was basically lost to the barbarians, mm. it, they developed kind of separately. And still, yes, we're one church, but a lot, a lot of communication for many centuries. Over time, those differences manifested itself with the Church of the West, which is Rome, became Roman Catholic, and the Church of the East, which is the large Orthodox communion. In about 1054, um, some disagreements happened and the split became official between Mm. Catholic and Orthodox, Church of the West, Church of the East. That's the big picture split between them two. Let's narrow it down just to the orthodox for a bit in the east remember how i said we had these councils that came to solve these disputes that was all good until we got to the fourth council yeah chalcedon chalcedon the council of chalcedon was a bit problematic because the terminology used in the council of chalcedon was not acceptable to the way the alexandrian church understood saint cyril Mm. who preached in the unity of christ he is one nature or in one nature, one nature. But from two natures, but in one nature. The terminology that was used through the in influence of the West, Rome and, and a few other parties was not really acceptable to us and a number of other Orthodox churches. Because of that, that became really the sticking point between Alexandria and a few other Orthodox churches mm-hmm. and the rest of the Orthodox communion, Constantinople, you know, which became the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate and Russia, who later on came from Mm. them. So that was the sticking point at 451 where there was a split. That being said, history has demonstrated to us that the differences between us are semantic Mm. um, by and large. Some people will disagree with me. Would you say Um, political as well? At the time? Of course. Everything is political. Mm. So certainly a lot of politics were involved and there was, you know, many, many years and centuries of attempts by emperors to rule, the, to, to heal the split mm. because of, you know, the importance of Alexandria. But once Islam came to Egypt mm. and Alexandria fell um, under Islam, that sort of drive wasn't there anymore to reunite the church again. So because the Alexandrian church was surviving under Islam for the next millennia yeah. and more, um, there haven't been that many renewed efforts at reconciliation. But that's happening now. And I think, you know, 1300 years or even 1500 years of history has showed us that actually our differences are very minimal. And a lot of the differences were just in words, but the essence of what we were both trying to say it's was the same. The same mm. But we were trying to safeguard this aspect. They were trying to safeguard that aspect. Both correct but extreme emphasis on each one and differences in language and politics led to those differences. So that's why the uh, Coptic Orthodox Church and a few others, the Syrians, Ethiopians, who generally sided with us, um, have not been technically in communion with um, the rest of the Greek, uh, the rest of the Orthodox Church. That being said, there are many places in the world where unity is found. I know in, in Egypt, there's in Alexandria, there's unity in some respect. Um, and so that's something we work towards and we, and we believe and we believe in. 
So do you think it will happen? Like your personal opinion? <laughs> or is it going to be a very, very long process? Not in our generation, maybe. Look, it, it, the, our divisions are, are what destroys Christianity. Wow. You know, the That's fact that point. we are divided mm. makes people think, well, if these guys can't even figure it out and be united, then what's the point of this whole Christianity thing? Mm. And so as a general principle, we should be united. Um, Pope Shenouda came very close. Um, I know that he came close and there was some movements towards it, but there's a lot of political issues at play. Um, whether it can happen at that higher level, mm. I don't know. There's a few things that have to be worked out because we sort of attack some of their saints. They attack some of our saints. <laughs> yeah, we have to right. sort of is like it, let that bit, go yeah. <laughs> um, and let bygones be go yeah. bygones. But what I believe is that on the ground level, at our mm. level, mm. we can certainly affect unity on our level. That when, when we deal with our Orthodox brothers and sisters, we acknowledge and we stress we are one church. We are one faith. We believe in the same thing. We have the same principles, the same saints, the same origins. Um, and we are one church. At political level, that's between them and God and for them to answer that's to God. Authority, yeah. But at our level, certainly on our parish level, in our friendship groups, if we are united in spirit, in worship, in love, then I think that is the most powerful way that we can get the ball rolling. That will create a movement. Um, a big it may movement. create a movement that, mm. you know, um, but certainly if the individuals in each church are saying heretics her and brandishing her the, the, the word heretic mm. um, to different people, then certainly I don't think that's helpful. We know in essence, we are one faith, one body, one church. No, it's beautiful. No, thank you, Abuna. You've covered it quite well. So what would you say if you were to talk about the, the whole topic of our history? What are the main events that we... Because I know history is not really touched upon like recently, especially when we go to different youth meetings. History is not one of the topics that people want to delve on because sometimes for others it's a bit boring or it's too mm -hmm. long or they don't understand what's mm -hmm. going on. What do you think if, if someone wanted to give you like 10 quick points on how history our history is important what are the main events would would you say look i think it's important to know history um for a number of reasons mm. um to be able to have an effective dialogue in this country you have to know history you cannot uh effectively dialogue with a protestant person unless you know where they've come from That's you true. cannot talk to a catholic person unless you know where they've come from for example if a catholic person comes in you say oh you guys believe in this you're heretic but you don't know that to be the case um same with protestants we attack, we attack, but we have to understand where have they come from? What are the things they were reacting against? Um, what are their core beliefs? What are the things about orthodoxy uh, are so powerful, you know, that it never felt the need to have a split movement into, orthodox, into Protestantism, for example. Mm. We know that from Catholicism is where Protestantism spread. It happened in the, yeah. in the 16th century. That's right. And the Orthodox community had nothing to do with that, wasn't involved in that dialogue. Um, in fact, interestingly, the, the earliest reformers, they thought the Orthodox were um, the ancient church. Wow. So they reached out and they said, hey, we're coming back to you. You know, these Catholics have got it all wrong and they've messed everything up. So we want to come back to the original church. And then they started this dialogue with one of the, um, the patriarchs. And by the end of it, it was like, you guys get out of here. You know, we have nothing in common. Oh. So they actually thought, saw in us, the Orthodox, the original faith, the original church, and they wanted to come back or not wanted to come back. They thought that we were aligned yeah. when in fact that wasn't the case. Do they think but, we're too strict or something or too like close minded, would you say? No, a lot of what they were believing, a lot mm. of what that they were believing in terms of, you know, no priesthood, sola scriptura, which means oh, wow. by scripture yeah, alone, by faith yeah. alone, all of these things. Yeah, yeah. They had gotten rid of um, Holy Communion, confession, all of the sacraments. They thought they were going back to the original, but actually the Orthodox said, no, 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 hang on a second. You guys have, have gone a little bit, a little bit um, out of the way in this mm. case. But certainly there is a lot of, there is a strong movement from many um, Protestant churches, especially the Pentecostal churches. And a lot of Protestant churches, there's a strong movement to come back to orthodoxy, that authenticity that we have. Um, there, is, there is a big movement to come back to orthodoxy. So, so to know history, to know Reformation, to know your reformers, to know where they've come from, what are their strong points. All of these things encourages us to have a good dialogue. So that's one thing I think history is so important. Mm. The other point I would make is that to mine history, to, to you know, find out theological positions and all of these things, that's fine. Um, 
But I don't know that it's that helpful. Actually, I think the best thing to do with history is find out how does it actively manifest in the living of our faith today. Mm, that's a really good point. What are the principles, the historical principles that we should apply? For example, if we look back and we look at the Council of Chalcedon, what are we going to find? We're going to find fighting, politics, people behaving badly, um, all of these things that are not really edifying. But if we look at history, for example, and one thing I've been looking at recently is the history of missions. How has wow. the church spread? Mm. And if through history we open up, for example, the Acts of the Martyrs and we say, wow, look what these people endured for the sake of their faith. Look at what, you know, and, and we read the transcripts of the case trials. Not a lot of the stuff that's in the Cynic Psalm, which is like, later you go back to the original case trials of the Martyrs you know, Perpetua um, and Felicity, if you look up her, you'll find a beautiful story. Um, the Martyrs of Lyon, if you look up that, um, that uh, excerpt, you'll find an incredibly beautiful story. And you see how actually individual Christians lived out their faith in the fullest. And moving on from there, after the era of persecution, how did they spread their faith? What were the principles? Mm. What does mission mean for us as an Orthodox Church? How does it... You know, what they did then teach us about today. You know, what are the principles that we need to get, gauge from history in terms of mission and bring it back so again. we can apply it today? Because yeah. who cares about history, dry history? We care about it only insofar as it reflects the present, insofar as it manifests changes in the present. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, like you need to know your history in a way that you can use it to benefit your future or benefit 100%. the movement that you want to create. So don't go in the dark side of history and try to mine, like you said, mine stuff that's not going to be useful. It's going to be 100%. dry. Like, how's that going to help you? That's right. And if you look at, like, for example, the history of missions, you look at how a lot of the Jesuits, because, of course, we don't say only the Orthodox are, you know, that in fact, the, the 95% of mission. And social work in, in, in Western society has been done by the Roman Catholics. Catholic Church, yeah. um, and if we look at the history of how they engaged in mission in Japan, in China, all over the world, there's a lot that we can learn from how amazing they did and also a lot of pitfalls that we have to be aware of. Mm. So things like that, I think, are very important in terms of, of history. Looking at the history of the big players, the patriarchs and all this, Sometimes it's edifying, sometimes it's very unedifying. Mm. But looking at the history of, for example, the, the real notable mystics, the saints, St. Saint Isaac the Syrian, you know, Oregon, who wrote incredible things. Um, all of, if we mine, his St. Anthony, uh, St. Athanasius, if we mine those giants mm. and their writings and the way they express their Christianity in the fullest, the Desert Fathers, um, we find things that are relevant to us. Wow, these are individuals that lived out their Christianity on another level. How are we living out our Christianity? So the points that I would take from history are only the points that will edify you individually, will edify your behavior, will change your way of thinking to live more fully in and through Christ. Yeah, so you don't want to use like people that always use knowledge, like to be knowledgeable for the sake of argument or being able to... Like if someone from another faith or interfaith come in and be like able to answer their questions and, you know, have a defense mechanism in place in case they get asked, you know, why do you guys do mm -hmm. this? Why do you believe in sacraments? Mm -hmm. You're saying, you're, Abuna, you're saying like we should do it with love rather than do it with an, with an attacking response. Like you 100%. do it in a, in a way where they can listen to your argument because if you take it in a it's me versus you kind of scenario, I think that that's when no one wants to listen. Everyone just wants to like, you know, yeah. voice each other and go on top of each other's voices and try to scream at each other. And at the end of the day, we, we don't create that fellowship. Yeah. We don't create that unity that we're trying to create. That's and right. so like the other thing is, as, as for us Coptic Orthodox youth, what do you think? Do you think it's good for us that we, for example, we go and uh, mingle with um, churches like the Syrian Orthodox churches, you know, churches that like us to come across to them and, and speak to them. I know the Syrian Orthodox are pretty similar to the Coptic Orthodox, but like for other churches, like I remember one time we had the um, Antiochian Orthodox mm. Church come mm. over at Bexley Church, mm -hmm. one of our churches here. So do you think that dialogue is healthy as well in, in that sense? 100%. I mean, like you said, we learn history 
sent to so we know our faith so we know the important aspects of our faith so we can explain it to others mm. so we can encourage others who are trying to learn like you said there's no point having a conversation with somebody who is coming to attack i've had many conversations with um, pentecostal christians and both on my part on their part there's no enga- there's no engagement to learn there's just an engagement to attack yes. i'm listening to what they're saying and coming up with the argument in my mind my response before they've even finished and vice versa that's not a helpful conversation. I always say to people, do not engage in those conversations. St. Saint Saint Peter says, always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you a reason of the hope that is in you, in meekness and fear. So we always have to be ready to give a defense, but that defense is an explanation. It's an encouragement for somebody who wants to learn. Somebody's come to a text say, let's focus on the things that unite us. Let's focus on Christ. We all believe in Christ. Let's focus on prayer let's focus on the bible we all have the bible in common anyone who's coming who is entrenched in their faith and doesn't want to learn orthodoxy let's unite over the things that 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 we have in common in terms of dialogue with other churches of course 100 percent. any other orthodox church even catholics you know we are so intricately intricately connected to other orthodox churches and to catholic churches that we should be supporting one another. We should mm. be dialog- dialoguing with one another. You know, there are so many beautiful things in the Catholic Church that we can learn from. They're saints. They've got saints. If you look at our Synexarium, our Synexarium, 90% of the saints come from the third, third or fourth century. century. That's correct. We have, we're um, very common saints, like between the churches, like Catholic and... and yes, but in terms, of the, in terms of the Catholics, they have saints that come you know, from a few years ago. We have a few as well, but not as many. They're Mother Teresa, Father Damien. They have got millions that we can learn from. So Mm. there's so much we can learn from the other Catholic churches and the the Orthodox churches. We should be united in a dialogue. We should be talking and learning from each other, encouraging each other, um, at least on this level, so that one day maybe, who knows, we could have unity. So ecumenism is is very important. Like you think that it's a good good movement to have. 100%. If we can demonstrate a united front, to people who are not Christian. It's Mm. like you see in a church, you have united priests, you have a successful church. You have a united parents, you have a successful family. You know, you have a united group of friends, you have edification, division, hostility, hatred, fighting, jealousies, envy. And that's what St. James says, confusion and every evil thing exists in that place. So we have to be united um, and present a united front to everyone. Not when someone comes to me, oh, Catholics know they're heretics, Greeks, they're heretics. And then they say, well, what makes you think that out of everyone, yeah, exactly. you figured it out? And, and, that's, and that's not edifying. Well, I've anyway. seen it. Like, I've seen it where, where, you know, people come, they get welcomed to our church. And then, you know, you, you just have this dialogue. There's always a person there or, or not a person. It's just the idea of like, hey, oh, okay, you're Catholic. So you really won't get us. Like the idea, and, like we don't say it to them. We're obviously welcoming. But at the same time, we're like okay, you're a bit different. Like, you know, you have that prejudgment in your head and I think that's wrong. Like, I think oh, we definitely. had, like you, like you said, Abuna, there has to be a dialogue between us and it's very important that we need to um, know our history to be able to help us in the future and to not use it in a, in a bad way, but to use it in a, in a beneficial way so that mm-hmm. we can find common ground with other churches. That's right. that's thank right. you so much, Abuna. And, and, and it's, it's a really big topic to cover in one episode, but thank you so much. And for our viewers at home, um, it's, 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 it's a wonderful topic uh, for us to be listening to about the history of the church. And we'll continue on the next episode uh, regarding very specifically our Coptic, so stay ch- uh, Coptic church. So stay tuned for the next episode. Uh, and for everyone at home and our viewers online, thank you so much and have a good night. God bless.